recording this. Excellent. All right, over to you then, Shu. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for um, joining us for this talk this morning. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, before I sort of kick things off, I just want to first thank a few people. The first being the individuals who have actually contributed to the research already. It's because we've been able to work with people who are living with MND that we've been able to get from testing ideas in the lab to a clinical trial in the last five years. And we could only have done it because of the contribution of people like yourselves. I also would like to thank uh, MND Research Australia, as well as MND Queensland, because a lot of the funding that started off this project came from the support of the MD organizations and particularly MD Australia, who supported the first um, study that we did in people living with MD and since then has continued to support a lot of the research that we've done in the lab. So, yeah, with that, I'm just going to talk today about a project, one of the projects, one of the many that we do in the lab, and this is particularly focused on targeting metabolic flexibility in Excuse ALS. Me. I'm going to start with a general overview of ALS. Um, it, it's interesting because it's a conversation that people don't really tend to have with their neurologists, which um, is actually quite an important conversation so that people can understand the type, or at least start to understand the type of disease that they have and how this actually impacts their journey. So the, the common term used in the US is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS. And in fact, ALS is actually just one of the many subtypes of motor neuron disease. So motor neuron disease is the umbrella term that's used to describe a group of neurodegenerative diseases that affect the neurons that control your voluntary movement. Now, I would liken the term motor neuron disease to the term cancer. There's many different types of cancers. So there's many different types of motor neuron disease. What we have in the image here, can you see my mouse? on the screen, yep, um, is a, a spectrum of motor neuron diseases. And what we've got down here in this arrow is lower motor neurons versus upper motor neurons. So the lower motor neurons are actually the neurons that control your voluntary movement that are in the spinal cord. So these are the lower motor neurons. These lower motor neurons are actually connected to the upper motor neurons, which are in the region of the brain, which is usually the motor cortex, it kind of sits like a crown across the top of your head here. And that those are the neurons that control voluntary movement, which then project their long axons down into the spinal cord, make the connections with the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord, which then project out to your skeletal muscle. And that's essentially the circuit that is impacted in motor neuron disease. And what we see in people with motor neuron disease is that there is what um, people normally call heterogeneity, which means people are very variable. Not one MND patient is the same. You will notice that you, you may have gone to um, other support sessions where you notice that some patients are very different to yourself in how they present and how they progress. And that really is determined by the type of neuron that is impacted. If you have a type of disease where it's mostly the upper motor neurons or the one in the neurons in the brain, that are affected, you tend to have a lot of stiffness and spasticity. And it's a highly debilitating condition, but you don't get that weakness and wasting that you would see in an individual who has the death of the motor neurons in the spinal cord. Right? So um, people who have a upper motor neuron predominant disease tend to fall in what the neurologists refer to as primary lateral sclerosis. And lifespan for PLS is actually quite long and people, some people will actually pass away with PLS rather than from PLS. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we've got lower motor neuron dominant diseases where it's essentially the neurons in the spinal cord that are primarily affected. And so what you will see with these individuals is they, um, neurologists might refer to it as flail arm or flail leg where it's just the arms that are primarily affected and they become a bit weak and wasted and so the function is not great or it could just happen in the legs or it could be the arm in, in the legs but that's usually just the motor neurons in the spinal cord that are impacted. 
When you get to ALS, which is the most aggressive type of motor neuron disease, that's a disease that is really characterized by both the upper and lower motor neurons being impacted. So both in the brain and the spinal cord, you're getting the death of those motor neurons and you're getting the spread of the disease throughout the whole central nervous system. And that's why the progression is quite rapid because it can impact multiple regions of the body in a short or fairly long period of time. And the last motor neurons that are generally affected or that lead to um, people passing away from ALS is the breathing neurons, the ones that control your breathing, so your diaphragm. And of course, if your diaphragm muscles aren't strong enough, you do get that respiratory insufficiency. So that's essentially the spectrum of motor neuron diseases. And that's one of the reasons why it's been so difficult for us to find a treatment for MND, because essentially everyone is so different. We're chasing a bit of a moving target in terms of looking for treatments. Now, one thing that the lab here at the University of Queensland have been focusing on is this idea of metabolic regulation, which is essentially how the body uses and generates energy. And this really came off the back of a study in 2010, which suggested that people who are slightly heavier in body weight actually tended to have better outcomes in motor neuron disease. And it's, it's an interesting concept because, you know, for motor neuron disease, oh, we thought, oh, that's fantastic. But if you take a step back and think about diseases as a whole, whether that's cancer treatment or anything, people who are bigger tend to be able to survive diseases a lot better. And it's just because their body has a bit more energy to work through to cope with the impacts of any disease that they're living with. But essentially, metabolic regulation is controlled through a number of things. One is energy consumption, so how much energy you're consuming through your diet, and then energy expenditure, which is how much energy you're using in your day-to-day -day life. Generally, the energy equation in the human body is made up of a few things in terms of energy expenditure. There's resting energy expenditure, which is how much energy your body uses just at rest. If you were sitting all day, that's the energy that your body uses just for you to sit there and do nothing else. Then there's activity dependent energy expenditure, which is you get up, you go for a walk, you go to the bathroom, any activity that you do, there's energy use associated with that. Then finally, there's dietary induced thermogenesis. Um, and that's the energy it takes for your body to break down the foods that you eat. I don't know if many of you experience it, but I certainly do. As soon as I've had a meal, my body temperature goes up and I start to burn through the food that I'm eating. So that's dietary induced thermogenesis. So these three components make up energy use versus energy intake. Now, what we've been looking at in people with motor neuron disease is essentially resting energy expenditure, which is the energy that your body burns at rest. There's this concept in motor neuron disease that there is this increased use of energy at rest. And this isn't a new concept. It's um, something that's been studied since the mid 1990s. And the idea is that in MND, if you have increased energy expenditure, and decrease energy intake, whether that's because you've lost your appetite or your weakness in your hands is causing you to maybe not want to prepare foods as often, so you're not eating as often, or whether you simply don't want to hassle somebody to make you a meal, right, that could decrease your energy intake, which essentially compromises that, that balance in energy homeostasis in your body and essentially could lead to weight loss. And as I said before, this increase in energy expenditure in motor neuron disease is not a new concept. In 1991, um, a Japanese group had already shown that there were changes in energy use in people with MND. But interestingly, that was hypometabolism, which is a decrease in energy use. And that was primarily on people who were on non-invasive ventilation. I think that's because they were um, their breathing was assisted through a machine, so they're not burning through as much energy. But from 1996 up until 2017, many, many groups have started to show that people with MND had this increase in resting energy use. And even though from 1996 over that 
10, 20 years, this phenomenon was described. The problem was we didn't know what it actually meant. If someone has increased energy expenditure, what is, what is the outcome? What does that mean for someone living with MND? What does that mean for us as scientists? Or what does that mean to the clinicians in terms of how we consider this in the context of the disease as a whole? So what we decided to do um, was to take a step back and to think about this question because, um, you know, Derek and I work with patients quite a lot. We know what people are going through. We've seen what people are going through and we, and we want to change the dialogue really that patients are having with their neurologists. And one thing that we noticed about all of the studies in the past is that um, they use these standard equations to predict how much energy somebody uses. So, you know, they linked mathematics with a bit of physiology to say, you know, if you're male or female, if you're this tall, if you weigh this much, then based on an average of what we see in normal humans, this is how much energy you should be using. But we know that people with MND aren't like everyone else. What we know in people with MND is that when you get the loss of neurons, you get the loss of weight. And that's primarily because muscle is wasting. So you can't use an equation for a normal population and apply that to people with motor neuron disease because you're going to get inherent errors with what you're coming out with at the end because the amount of muscle that's lost in people with motor neuron disease is not accounted for in these equations. So we decided to revisit this story and we did a simple thing of measuring energy expenditure in people with MND correcting it for their body composition, which is the amount of muscle and the amount of fat mass that they have. So some of you may have already been involved in these studies, or you may have heard of these studies. But what we do is we use this machine called a bod pod. It essentially looks like a big spaceship. And people will sit in this uh, machine, this bod pod. And what it will do is it will predict how much energy your body should use. Now, the, the good thing about the bod pod is it's similar to wet water weighing. I know back in the day, people used to get dunked in water. How much water they displaced was a measure of how heavy they were or how dense they were. This uses air. So people sit into this chamber. It pushes, displaces air from the chamber. And from there, you can figure out how much fat mass and how much muscle mass you have in your body. When we combine that information with your sex, your age, your height, and your weight, we have a prediction of how much body your uh, how much energy your body should use based on your lean and fat mass. What we then do is we have people lie on a bed, we put this bubble canopy over their heads, and we measure how much oxygen they're consuming relative to how much carbon dioxide they're producing. And much like a fire, your body burns oxygen, the hotter your body burns, the more oxygen you're going to use. So when we measure this um, flow of oxygen and carbon dioxide, we're actually measuring how much energy your body is using. And we can compare these two numbers. And if what we measure is a lot higher than what is predicted, then we can say that it is a situation where you are hypermetabolic or burning more energy than you should be. And what we've done over the years, we started this project back in 2015, and this was the first project that was funded by MD Australia, is we measured this in people here in Australia, well, particularly in Brisbane, and then we compared what we measured relative to the clinical scores. Some of you may have seen your neurologist and done that questionnaire called the ALS FRSR that asks you about walking upstairs, turning in bed, doing your bed clothes. So we compared what we measured in these two systems relative to that score. We looked at disease duration, um, essentially time from when you first noticed symptoms or time when you were first diagnosed. And then we compared this also to your weight and body composition. And the question really is, what is the prognostic relevance of hypermetabolism in MND? Or more simply, if you're hypermetabolic, how does this impact how your disease progresses? Or what is your outcome? What we found was that about 40% of people with MND in the cohort that we looked at were hypermetabolic. And this is much higher than the 12% of people who we assessed who didn't 
have MND. So these are, you know, friends and family members of people who are living with MND who have come to visit our research as well. With an odds ratio of 5.4, if you ever see OR or odds ratio, it essentially just means the likelihood that someone's going to have this. So in people with MND, they are essentially five times more likely to have hypermetabolism than people who don't have MND. And of course, we adjusted for age, sex, body mass index, and smoking, because we know that as we get older, our metabolism goes down. That's why we get a bit podgier. Um, and of course, males tend to have more muscle mass than females. So of course, they're going to have high energy expenditure as well. So once we corrected for all these variables that might impact metabolism, this is the result that we came up with. And so when we looked at the metabolic rate of somebody relative to their clinical features, and this is essentially the ALS FRSR score, which is that um, questionnaire that I spoke about that really sort of assesses your function and how you're progressing through disease. We've got two lines on this graph. So this is the ALS FRSR score here on the y-axis. And this is the time since we assessed individuals on the x-axis. So the dotted line here is essentially when we looked at somebody, when we assessed their energy expenditure, then we've got six months prior, six months after, and a year after. We've split the cohort into two groups, people with MND who have a normal metabolism, or essentially they're normal metabolic, people who have a faster metabolism than expected, meaning that they're hypermetabolic, which is the pink one. And you can see that the slope of the pink line here is much steeper than the slope of the blue line. So what this essentially means is that people who are hypermetabolic have a faster progressing disease or a more severe type of disease if you're looking at that ALS FRSR score. And I think the, the major outcome which really drove us to go back into the lab to see whether or not we could modify metabolism and then identify a drug that we could push into clinical trials was when we assessed the survival of individuals who had normal versus a very high metabolism. Again, normal metabolism here is in the blue line and high metabolism is in the pinkish red line. And each one of these steps is people who have passed away in the study. Down here, we've got the number at risk. So this is the number of people who are still in the study that are in the increased or normal metabolism group at 0, 6, 12, 18, 24, and 30 months since we assess them. And this is the probability of survival with 100% being 100% chance of survival. And I hope what you can appreciate is that the pink line um, has a lot more steps than the blue line, meaning that survival in general is going to be shorter in people who have this high metabolism. So now we figured out, well, maybe in metabolic rate, this increase in metabolic rate is potentially a bad thing. And if it is a bad thing, is it something that we can target clinically? Can we slow down metabolism? And then can we improve the extension of survival for people who are living with MND? So to do this, we had to go back to the lab. Actually, we were kind of doing things in the lab in parallel because, you know, that's what we do as scientists. We come up with ideas and we test them in multiple ways. But what we have in the lab is a mouse that's called the SOD1 G93A mouse. It's essentially a mouse that has had a mutation in a human gene that is known to drive MND put into its DNA. So the mouse over time will develop MND-like symptoms, it'll have loss of motor neurons in its spinal cord, it'll get muscle weakness, and eventually we euthanize the animals when they get to a stage where their um, hind limbs are quite paralyzed. So what we've done here is we've actually done the same experiments in mice as what we do in people with MND. But rather than putting mice on a bed, we actually have these massive chambers that the mice go into. Each mouse has its own cage, and we can measure how much oxygen it's consuming relative to how much carbon dioxide it's producing. And at the end of that, we can actually assess how much fat mass and how much muscle mass is in these mice. So what we're showing here in panel A is we've got three, three graphs, whoops, three graphs, um, PS, OS, and MS. 
So PS is a mouse that is pre-symptomatic, meaning that it has no symptoms of motor neuron disease at all. Onset is when the mice start to develop these symptoms that are meant to recapitulate or recapture what we see in the clinic and that mice start to get a bit of Heimlich weakness. And what we know is at this age, mice are starting to lose motor neurons in the spinal cord. Mid-symptomatic is a stage of disease where mice are a lot further progressed. So their symptoms are a lot more severe or at least the phenotype. I won't say symptoms because symptoms are what people have. Mice have a phenotype, which is a presentation of a trait. So the phenotype in these mice is that they're a lot more progressive in their paralysis and we get a higher loss of motor neurons in the spinal cord in these mice. And what we've measured here is oxygen consumption. So the black line here are the mice that don't have motor neuron disease. So they're the brothers and sisters of the mice that do. And the blue line are the mice with motor neuron disease. So you can see that um, there's a bit of a pattern. The gray area is the nighttime and mice are nocturnal. So when they're nocturnal and moving a bit, they're consuming more oxygen. So it's nice to have this diurnal pattern because we know that the animals are doing what they should be doing. When we look at the data over these time points, what we see, and this is the most important graph to look at, is that at the stage of disease when mice have quite a strong phenotype and they're losing a lot of motor neurons, you can see that their oxygen consumption, which is the, the blue dots here, they're much higher than the mice that don't have motor neuron disease. So the mice, in a way, are very similar to people with MND where they have this increase in metabolism. And we thought, well, because mice are more active at night, maybe it's just because they're running around more. So we compared it to the activity of the mice. This, this is this, these graphs down here. This again is the activity over time. And we can see that in fact, the motor neuron disease mice are a lot less active in general when compared to the mice that don't have MND. So we at least know that this increase in energy expenditure is not just because the mice are running around like crazy in their cages. So what we wanted to do was figure out if we could reverse this increase in metabolism in our mice. Um, so since 2015, my lab and a lab in France have been looking at a number of drugs that might be able to do this. And what we've noticed in the background is that there seems to be a change in the way that the, the muscles and neurons in the mice use energy. So the, the neurons and skeletal muscle are very dependent on sugar or glucose as an energy substrate. And only in instances of starvation will they turn towards burning the fat on their bodies to use that as an additional energy source. And what we found in the MND mice is they tend to start using the fat as the energy substrate a lot earlier than what would be expected. So there seems to be this switch in how they're using energy. And um, this also happens in muscle that we've collected from people with MND. We've noticed that the similar change in energy use occurs that they tend to depend more on fat than on sugar. So over the years, we've tested a few drugs. One was dichloroacetate that's used in cancer. And what it does is it promotes the use of sugar as an energy substrate. And what we showed in those mice is that um, dichloroacetate improved function in the mice, but not necessarily survival. So we've, we've hit one aspect where we've been able to improve the, the, the function of the muscle, but not the back end, which is the survival. So last year, we tested another drug and we published that data last year. That's a drug that's used here in Australia to treat um, heart conditions. And what that does, it helps um, improve the use of sugar as well over fat. So it preferred, changes the energy use in preference of glucose. And again, we showed that that drug improved function, again, in mice, but unfortunately not survival. So we took a bit of a step back and we looked at other compounds that were similar. Now, the drug that we tested and published in 2020 is a drug that completely stops the use of fatty acids as a substrate, which when I sort of sat down and thought about it, I realized is actually a bad thing. 
because there must be a reason for why people with MND or our mice start using fat as an energy source. And it could be because they're not able to use the sugar because of changes in their muscle and neurons. So I thought, well, we need to get a drug that sort of is a bit of an in-between. It kind of stops the use of fatty acids to some extent to promote the use of sugar, but it still allows the body to use fats when it needs to. So we picked this drug, which I've numbered F437436, <laughs> because that's the lab book that we started the experiment in. <laughs> But essentially, you'd know that it's called trametazidine because that's what we'll be talking about a bit later. And we decided to test this drug trametazidine. And we've put it in the water of the mice and we've started treating them from 70 days, which is essentially when we first start seeing those phenotypes of muscle weakness and motor neuron loss in our sod mice. And then what we did is we measured them at 110 and 130 days for the energy expenditure which is that time where we know that they have that higher energy expenditure. And in another batch of mice that were treated at disease onset, we looked at survival. The reason why we chose disease onset is because we know that clinically, if people are coming in, if they're ever going to get a drug, it's while they've got the disease. It's not long before they've developed the disease, which is the pre-symptomatic stage in our mice. So we tried to design an experiment that would be more clinically translatable, essentially. So here we've got the results from the energy metabolism assessment. These are our wild type mice. So these are the brothers and sisters that don't have motor neuron disease. And we've got vehicle, which is just water. And then we've got the drug. And you can see that in these non-MND mice, we've got that nice diurnal pattern and nothing's really different. The drug doesn't really do much for these mice. But here we've got the sod that are on water and the sod that are on the drug. So the darker blue line is water, the lighter blue line is the drug. And what I hope you can see or appreciate is that the, the sod mice or the MND mice that aren't on the drug, their line is much higher than the ones that are on the drug. So when we analyze the data, what we can see is that yes, our sod mice that are on water have this increase in metabolism, but the, the sod mice, the MND mice that have been given the drug, their metabolisms actually decrease. And it's similar to their brothers and sisters, okay, that are um, without motor neuron disease and that are on the drug or on water. So we took away from this that this drug is preventing this increase in metabolic rate that we see in our mice. And I think the most exciting thing is of all the drugs that we've tried, this is the one drug that's improved survival in our mice. So this survival graph is very similar to the one I showed you earlier with our patients in the study, with each drop in the line being a mouse that we've euthanized from the study based on its phenotype. The gray line here are the MND mice that are on water, and the blue line is the MND mice that are on the drug. And what you can see is that because that line, the blue line extends out further in terms of days against survival, we've actually been able to extend the survival of these MND mice. And when you look at it overall, it's about an 18 day improvement in survival. Um, this is pretty good. Um, I've seen so far that drug treatment in mice tends to at least in other studies, extend survival by about seven to 10 days. So 18 days is actually pretty good. Now this study, this, this data here is from the male mice, which is 18 days. When we look at female mice, the change in survival is about 15 days. So it's still pretty good. So what we're doing now is we're also using human derived cells to test trametazidine in the background. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is that even though we're running a clinical trial, what we need to do is generate a lot of information that is going to support us to transition it into a phase three if the phase two um, results are positive. So some of you may have met Derek. Um, Derek is my partner in crime and research, but he's also my husband. Um, so we do a lot of research together. Um, two brains are better than one in this instance. Um, so Derek and our PhD student, Howe, are currently doing a lot of the trametazidine experiments in 
other mouse models of the disease. And then of course, my colleague in France is doing it in two other models of disease. What we're also doing is we're making patient cells. So we take skin cells from people with MND, we turn those into stem cells, and then we can drive the stem cells into motor neurons. So these, these are the neurons here, which look similar to the ones in your spinal cord. And we're screening trametazidine on these neurons to see um, the extent to which trametazidine improves survival of these neurons in a dish. Um, the great thing about stem cell biology is that it's constantly evolving, which means two years ago we were making motor neurons. This year we're making spinal cord organoids. And these are essentially mini 3D spinal cords in a dish. Again, we're making them from the IPS, the stem cells that we've generated from people with MND. And what's really good about these spinal cord organoids is rather than just being neurons, they have all of the cell types that we would expect to see in a spinal cord. So we're trying to mirror a human spinal cord in a dish and we're testing our drugs on these organoids now to see whether or not we can improve the survival of not just neurons, but all the other cell types which are there to support the neurons and to help them function properly and live longer. And this is being driven by a very talented postdoc in the lab, Mo. So one thing we have done in our neurons is look at energy use. And this is um, a TDP43 group of neurons. I think um, some, of, sure I some of you may have heard about TDP43, which is a toxic protein which clumps up inside the neurons in MND. And we've and um, post-mortem analysis of tissue has shown that about 90% of all people with MND will have these toxic clumps of TDP43 in their neurons. So we made IPS neurons from TDP43 mutants. We actually made a stem cell that had a mutation in TDP43. And this is the wild type. So this is the same stem cells that don't have the mutation. And what we see is that the mitochondrial area and TMR fluorescence, which is essentially is a measure of mitochondrial function, is lower in the mutant neurons. So mitochondria are the powerhouses of our cells. They generate all of the energy that our cells need to do everything that they need to do, whether that is surviving, whether that is sending a nerve signal, down to the muscle, whether that's for the muscle to contract, the mitochondria are central for anything that involves energy, which is essentially everything <laughs> for the cell. So we can see that the mitochondria in our mutant neurons are smaller and they're not functioning as well. And here we've got a measure of caspase activity, which is essentially um, a process in the cell that gives us an indication of cell death. And we can see that the mutant neurons are having more death than the neurons that don't have TDP43. We've done some preliminary experiments, at least Tim did it during his PhD. Um, he's now gone on to do medicine, so hopefully he'll become a clinical neurologist and also stay as a scientist working in the field of MND. <laughs> I've put no pressure on him at all to do that, but I have asked him that I would like for him to do that. But he, he essentially did an experiment towards the end of his PhD where he put trametazidine on these neurons. And what he was able to do was recover some of these this death, so less neurons were dying in response to this drug, and the function of the neurons was improved. So based on that data, we decided that we wanted to run a clinical trial. And we applied for funding, and this was funded two years ago by MND. There's been a lot of signing of contracts in the background, but um, we had a site initiation visit last night which means as of hopefully tonight, we'll be able to start recruiting patients into this trial. So this is called the MetFlex trial because we're modulating metabolic flexibility. So we're tweaking metabolism in people with MND. And essentially the first step that we wanna do is test that this drug is safe and tolerable in people with the disease. So the drug we're using is trametazidine. It's approved in Europe for treating um, heart conditions. Unfortunately, it's not approved in Australia or the US for any use. So it's only available in Europe. We've ordered the drug in. This is a phase two trial. It's open label, which means everyone who's on the trial will actually get the drug. There's no placebo in this trial. 
Um, to be on the trial, you have to meet eligibility criteria, which is one, you have to be hypermetabolic because that's what we're trying to change in people with MND. And this TriCal's risk score. So I'm not sure how many of you have um, inquired about clinical trials before, but you're mainly told if you've had symptom onset within a certain number of years or months, or you've been diagnosed within a certain number of years or months, you're no longer eligible for the trial. That criteria can be quite restrictive. So what we've done with this trial is used a TriCal score, which is a combination of many scores put together. So not only is it about your symptom onset and your date of diagnosis, but it's also about your ALS FRSR score and your breathing function. And all of these scores come together to give you a risk score. So it's not like we use a cutoff date of a certain number of months because um, it's the combination of scores that will give you a risk score. And as long as your risk score is between negative two to negative six, if you pass that, then you'll be eligible for the trial as long as you're also hypermetabolic. The trial goes for 20 weeks. Essentially, um, you have a screening visit with us where we determine whether or not you're able to meet all of the eligibility criteria. Um, taking tablets, for example, because um, trimetazidine is a tablet, and you take it twice daily. Um, if you pass the screening visit, you'll come in at baseline, and that's when we give you the drug. You'll be on the drug for 12 weeks, and then after that 12 weeks, you'll go off the drug for four weeks, and then you'll come back and see us, and we'll see whether or not throughout that time your metabolism changes. We'll also look at... Um, Adverse events, you know, is the drug having an effect on, you know, is it causing a bit of gut discomfort or is it making you nauseous or dizzy? So all of these things, information that we have to gather. And we're also going to look at the ALS FRSR. So it'll give us some indication of whether or not the disease might improve function. But because we've only got 36 participants, it's not a higher number and it's not a high enough number to definitively say that the drug will improve outcomes in the first instance. But if we know that the drug is safe and that it's tolerable in people with MND and that there's some hint that it might improve some of those um, criteria, the ALS, FRSR and your breathing function, it gives us a really strong case for going to phase three. Um, to be on the trial, you can, you can be taking Riluzole as long as you've been on Riluzole for at least 30 days or off Riluzole for 30 days. But as I said, um, the drug's not available in Australia, it's not TGA approved, which means once the trial is over, there's no longer access to this compound. So essentially this is how the, the trial is run. You come in at minus four for your screening visit. There's one, two, three, four, five, six visits in the clinic. Um, essentially visit two, four and six, and seven are in the clinic at three and five, which is week three and week nine, we actually give you a phone call. It's a bit difficult for people to come in every three weeks. Um, it's That's a real burden for people. So at three week intervals, we do break it up with a phone call just to see how you're going to do the ALS FRSR to see if, you know, there's no adverse events or anything that you're too concerned about in terms of the drug. Angela is the nurse who's overseeing the trial. So she will be giving you her contact number and you can contact her at any time of the day. She said any time of the day. So if it's 2 a.m. in the morning, you can still call her. <laughs> She'll take your call and answer any questions that you have. So at the end of the trial, we'll be looking at the primary outcomes, which, essentially, which is essentially, is it safe? Is it tolerable? Secondary outcomes are, does it give us some indication of whether or not the ALS FRSR is improving, whether breathing is improving, and then our exploratory outcomes do include things like oxidative stress, because we know that metabolism is linked to oxidative stress in the body. So we'll be looking at some of those markers as well. So that's the end of the talk. And I wanted to thank people who were involved. This is an image that was drawn by a little girl when her father was going through the study. So he came in to visit us. And um, this is him under the canopy <laughs> having his energy metabolism measured so i want to uh, you know i want to put this here because it's it's working with patients that keeps us and at least my team 
motivated in doing the right things and asking the right questions in the lab. There's science for science sake, and then there's science for people who are living with m and So our connection with patients and families is really, really important because that is actually what drives our research questions. And then of course, I wanna thank everyone who's involved in the funding, particularly m and Australia. And um, we have a volunteer <laughs> call. So if there's anyone who would like to be involved in the research, then you can contact myself or Derek. This is our email addresses down here. And um, we can get you enrolled into the studies. But of course, with the clinical trials, um, that would be through contacting Dr. Henderson at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. Okay, so I'm going to stop that. Should I stop the screen, the sharing? Um, yes, please. Yep. Um, thank you so much for that, um, Chu. It makes me realise just how lucky we are in Queensland to have people as brilliant as you and Derek and all of your colleagues, but also people as dedicated to um, the, the MND community. So that is really, really informative. Um, I feel cleverer having watched that presentation than before. So <laughs> excellent. Okay. All right. If you could all unmute yourself. Um, I'll unmute those that I can. And then let's open up to questions. Who wants to go first? Do any volunteers have to all go up to Brisbane? Yes, unfortunately they do. Um, the other option is to fly to the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> which is where our other site is. Um, but yeah, um, we have had people recently joining yeah, us from interstate. Yeah. And right. um, but, sorry. Yeah, but it, um, because the equipment here is in Brisbane, then people would, would be coming to Brisbane to, to contribute to the research. In terms of the trial, we're also um, enrolling people from around Australia. So if people are living in Melbourne or Sydney or the West Coast and they want to be involved in the trial and they make the criteria, then um, there's a mechanism for us to support them coming here to be involved in the trial. Um, Richard Demner here. I've got a question to shoot. Um, I, I was diagnosed since October 2020. Um, what I'm finding, um, I'm still fairly active. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm early. My appetite is going through the roof. It, as in, you've got a ravenous appetite? Yeah. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, it'd be great if you could be involved in our research because you're the first person who's actually said that to us. So <laughs> something about you is very unique. Um, in general, what we've seen is about a third of all people we've seen lose their appetite. So it'd be very interesting to know why your appetite is increased. We do have a sister study that's going on that's being led by Derek, looking at appetite in MND. And part of that actually involves brain imaging, because we think that there's a change in the way that the brain is encoding information. And it's, it's either driving a desire for food or driving a desire away from food. And so that, that study is actually actively recruiting as well and it runs in parallel with the metabolism work because appetite is such a big part of metabolism. So it'd be interesting to see why that is the case for you and not so much for a lot of other people. I'll touch base with Derek. I've got his email. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Would that be the same? Um research that Brett has done with the MRIs? Yes. Yeah, thought so. Yeah, <laughs> I was the test subject for that one, so it was, I, I found it really fun, so <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, it does involve, you know, 45 minutes, 45 minutes in the scanner, so it can be a bit long, yeah. but um, the information that we've been gathering from that study has been phenomenal. Actually, we've got a PhD student um, who's working on the brain images at the moment. Yeah. Will we be seeing you tomorrow? We're down for research tomorrow. No, I've got some meetings that I have to attend at St. Lucia. You'll right. be seeing Derek. Yes. <laughs> so, 
We're so, kind of the same person. <laughs> yeah. Yep. No, all good. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Did anyone else want to ask a question? At what stage of start from diagnosis of the duration of the disease do you notice the di the appetite changing? Is it from the start or middle or is it variable? It's variable between people. Um, and, and so that's why we are looking at, that's why we are doing MRI studies because the, the classical way of determining whether someone or not is um, losing their appetite is through a questionnaire. And as good as questionnaires are, they're very limited by the answers that are available for you to give. It, and it can be quite subjective. So the, the purpose of the MRIs are actually to see what might be changing in the brain. And because we can link that back to the clinical information of the person when they were diagnosed, when they first mm. saw symptoms, we'll be able to know a bit more about what might be driving these changes in a larger group of people. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, the drug um, trimetazidine is banned as a performance enhancer. Yes, it is. So may not any improvement be non-specific to ALS and the hypermetabolic state? Yeah, that's a very good point. So um, trimetazidine is the drug that the Chinese swimmer was on. And so it's on the um, water for uh, anti-doping. So it is a performance enhancing drug. The reason why it's considered a performing enhancing drug and why it's been banned is because what it does is improves the way that the body uses energy under low oxygen supply. So it's making the body work more efficiently than what it should be doing. So it, the, the reason why we think that it's helping is because we, when we have this increased energy expenditure in individuals with MND and in mice, we think it's because the body is burning energy very inefficiently. So I, I guess it's kind of like if you have a car and you don't take it for a service, mm. it's going to burn through more fuel than what it did if it was kept in check. So we're hoping that this trimetazidine is actually modulating how mm. the body is accessing its energy over time. So in a way, um, performance enhancing, but in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay, now second question. Um, the initial study that you talked about in terms of prognosis where um, I think 41% of ALS people were hypermetabolic. Mm -hmm. um, two questions arise out of that. One is, will this drug be likely to help those who are not hypermetabolic? And secondly, in the study, did were, were the study participants stable? So did the people who were hypermetabolic at the start remain hypermetabolic until death? And did those who weren't remain non-hypermetabolic? Those two very good questions. <laughs> so the first one is we are not, I cannot definitively say whether the drug would help people who were not metabolic. But on the other hand, I can also not definitively say whether it would help people who were hypermetabolic. Mm -hmm. So that's the purpose of doing the study. Yeah. Um, the reason why we're using hypermetabolism as a criteria is because that's something we're trying to modify. Hopefully in the phase three, we can stratify the trial in such a way that we can include both people who are hyper and normal metabolic. So we can compare those two cohorts. Um, I think... What we all appreciate with MND is yeah. that it's we're going to have to use a very personalized approach. So it could be that, you know, um, mm. hypermetabolic individuals will benefit from this drug. And so only hypermetabolic metabolic people would take the drug. And there could be something else for normal metabolic people. But essentially, it, it's going to have to be a personalized medicine approach for MND. Now, in relation to your second question, that's actually something that we've asked. We've, we've been collaborating with the Dutch group for the last five years. So the Dutch have also been collecting data on this. So we have a big enough data set now 
to ask exactly the question that you've asked us. We um, had our PhD student, Corey, do some preliminary analysis of the data a few weeks ago. And it looks that there are two very distinct cohorts of people. You are either hypermetabolic or you're not. If you're hypermetabolic, you stay hypermetabolic and you fluctuate. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're normal metabolic, you tend to be normal metabolic throughout. So mm -hmm. we're just completing the analysis of that data now. So it's, it's five years worth of data and we hope to publish that very soon. I have a question from Richard. Um, years um, overseas. How bad are the risks? I mean, do, do, we must know by now if um, it's evident that there are risks and some people get extreme side effects or are they mild side effects? In terms of the compound that we want to use? Yes. Okay. Um, a lot of the side effects are, I would say, standard for what you would see with any drug. So, um, I mean, with Riviazole, some people get fatigue, some people get gut discomfort. So we would we do expect that some people on trametazidine might experience mm. nausea, they might experience vomiting, they may experience um, fatigue or gut discomfort. So these are, you know, there's usually a a cluster of side effects that are associated with most drugs. The most severe side effect, although it's very rare with trametazidine, is the development of tremors, which is similar to Parkinsonian-like symptoms. So people who do have Parkinson's or Parkinsonian-like symptoms are not able to be on this trial. Um, what is important to know that though, even if you do develop those symptoms, They've shown previously that people who have developed that tremor and gone off the drug, that that tremor has disappeared. Okay. So it's not a long lasting effect. If you were to go off the drug, it's not something that's with you forever. Okay, any other questions? One, um... Placed on your studies so far, would you recommend that people avoid diets that are low in carbohydrate um, or ketogenic, for example? Oh. Okay, uh, I'm not a qualified dietitian to be able to comment accurately on dietary components. Um, and I think those conversations are best had with your multidisciplinary care team and neurologist in combination with your dietitian. What we do know is in research in mice is that a ketogenic diet does improve function, but not necessarily survival. And that's because ketones are a type of fat. They're a medium chain fat, which enter your mitochondria, your powerhouses immediately. So fatty acids tend to be these chains of fats. And um, with long chain fatty acids, you have to break off the fatty chains to be able to use fat as energy. So to get to fat as energy, you also have to burn energy. So the idea is that um, because these medium chain fats or ketones go straight into the mitochondria, they're a very good boost, immediate boost of energy. But I think the, the one concern about diets that are low carb or ketogenic yeah, is that yeah, there is that. this um yeah. in general yeah. these diets are used for weight loss so there's this concomitant weight loss that you see with these diets and if you think about what's been shown in people with mnd that a lower body weight tends to be bad for you then i think whether someone goes on a ketogenic diet or not really comes to down to their choice and what their dietitian suggests based on the presentation of their weight changes and <laughs> symptoms over time. There's been no clinical trial that's been well controlled enough to show that certain diets are better for people with MND. Um, I've uh, been on a low carb diet for about 15 years. Mm -hmm because of type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. and I favour fat. Um, 
with MMV. Like when I get ravenous, I'll reach for cheese, um, meat, um, fatty meat, and things like that. So I'll, I'll send an email to Derek and see mm -hmm. how I do this. Yeah. Is your type 2 diabetes well controlled? It used to be, but now oh. that I'm, I, I used to be able to maintain it. Um, HbA1c at about 5.8, 5.9. Mm. But I notice my instantaneous blood sugar is going through the roof at the moment. And mm -hmm. I suspect that something to do with the fact maybe the hypermetabolism um, mm. might be, I don't know, my liver might be producing more mm. um, glucose. I'm not sure mm. why. Yeah, so what we'll have to do is we'll have to modify our ethics because at this point in time, our research, um, we don't enroll people with diabetes. And that's because you're, you're a perfect example of why, because the diabetes actually impacts how your body responds to energy, Yeah. whether you're taking fat, whether you're taking sugar. So if we include diabetics in the study, it's hard for us to determine whether, the, whether what we're seeing is because of MND or because of your diabetes. But what we've noticed now is that well, what's been coming up in literature is that they tend to think that type 2 diabetes is protective some way for people with MND. And I think that's because with, with um, type 2 diabetes, people do tend to be a bit more overweight. And so it could be that weight that might be protecting people from the onset of MND. So we, I had this discussion with Derek last week, and we're going to modify our ethics to now include diabetics in the cohort to see whether or not there's something different with people with MND with diabetes versus MND without diabetes. Yeah. It's interesting that when I went on a low carb diet, I dropped from about 96 to about um, 86 kilos. Mm -hmm. And I, that weight ever since I started the low carb. So my yeah. weight is very constant but my appetite is going through the roof. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so that, that weight loss initially, um, which comes back to the previous question, is what I think people would be most concerned about, about going on ketogenic and low-carb diets, is that very rapid weight loss over a short period of time, which yeah. might exacerbate some of the M&D that people have. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll um, have a dialogue with Eric. Yeah, and I'll work on the ethics in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, Shu. Um, for people who have been contacted by you and been under into the little um, mod bod, um, and we apply, so you'll be contacting those people who qualify for your study soon. Yeah. So we had our visit last night. And we essentially need the clinical trial monitor to give us a letter to say that they are happy for us to proceed because they want to double check all our documentation. And once I get that letter, um, anyone who's interested in the trial can contact Dr. Henderson or Derek and myself mm -hmm. and um, people who we've sort of seen before who may qualify, we, I will contact as well. Okay, cool. I'll wait for your yeah. call. <laughs> okay. All right, any last questions before we wrap up? No? Um, okay. Sorry, Andrew, were you going Andrew? to ask? Well, look, I mean, I, I don't have ANS, I have tenodines, but mm -hmm. it sounds as though if I was hypermetabolic, it might be something that I would benefit from as well. If, I mean, because it's Presumably not necessarily specific just to ALS. MND. Yeah, that's true. So um, the reason why we picked trimetazidine is because it actually review, uh, reduced hypermetabolism in people with heart failure. So it's not um, specific to ALS. And I've sat back and thought about this on many occasions. And I think what hypermetabolism actually is is a biological readout of the body undergoing a trauma or a stress. And whether that's um, potentially 
the, the rate at which motor neurons are being lost. And so the body is then working at an inefficient rate to try and maintain function could be why we're seeing hypermetabolism. So, you know, I, I guess you can relate it to a biomarker, which is in a, a biological indicator of what's happening in the disease. So the reason why we're targeting hypermetabolism is because it's the readout of what's actually happening in people with MND, which means hypermetabolism, you know, people are severe burn, burns victims also have hypermetabolism, mm -hmm. you know, and you can imagine the trauma that their body is going through. So mm -hmm. if we can reverse hypermetabolism as a readout, well, with that being the biological readout, we know that we're doing something beneficial in the body that's bringing that readout back to normal. So potentially we're reducing some trauma, reducing mm -hmm. some of that um, motor neuron death. And that's why the, the experiments that we're doing in the lab are really important because they're very cross informative. Mm. Okay, excellent. Well, we will wrap up there then. So thank you again, Chu. Um, it's been really helpful and hopefully everyone now knows what they need to do if they want to be involved in the trial. Um, so we'll be, we'll, be keen to see what the outcome of, of the trial is. So hopefully mm. we'll get you back maybe when, when it's all over to, to yeah. show you results. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Excellent. Hopefully the results are great. And yes, then we fingers move crossed. It to sounds three. very promising. So, mm. all right. Thanks again. Nice to see everyone. Mm. And thank uh, you everyone for your time. Uh, yep. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thank see you. See you all soon, hopefully. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.